In the first part of the experiment, we made our benzoic acid, and then we purified it by recrystallisation. In the second part of the experiment, we're going to assess the purity of the sample we made, and we're going to use different, three different techniques to do that. Firstly, we'll do a melting point analysis. Secondly, we'll do a mixed melting point analysis. And finally, we'll carry out thin layer chromatography. The first test we're going to do to assess the purity of our benzoic acid is going to be a melting point analysis. And in order to do that, the first thing we have to do is get a thin walled glass capillary tube and we want to seal it at one end. So to do that we want the blue Bunsen flame and then we're going to stick the end of the tube into the hottest part of the flame and spin it round just to melt the end and seal it. Okay, and hopefully now you can see this end of the capillary tube has been sealed and we can transfer some of our benzoic acid into it. Just a couple of hazards to watch out for when you're sealing the capillary tube. If you don't spin it and you put it in for too long, you'll seal the end of the tube okay, but you'll end up with the capillary tube being bent and as you'll see in a minute this won't allow you to insert it into the melting point analysis machine. This is the melting point apparatus. It's really just a big metal block with a heater. And if we look at the top of the metal block, we see there's four holes. In the big hole, we put a thermometer to record the temperature of the metal block. And three small holes are for samples. We'll normally only use the middle hole and just do one sample at a time. However, we can at this stage, we can use the multiple apparatus to check that we have sealed the capillary tube properly. So, if we put our capillary tube in the middle block and turn the machine on a little bit so the light lights up, and if we put the capillary tube in upside down, and at least that's useful for seeing that the bottom of the capillary tube isn't uh, sealed, so I put it in the right way around. Right. If I get the camera angle just right, hopefully you can see that the bottom of the capillary tube is sealed. So we can safely put our benzoic acid crystals into that, knowing that they won't spill out. Getting the benzoic acid crystals into the sealed capillary tube is pretty low tech. All we do is just press down on the benzoic acid to try and get a few of the crystals in the tube and then to bring the crystals down to the bottom we just tap away just a wee bit more if the crystals are nice and dry they tend to go down the capillary tube nice and easily. So, hopefully you can see now that we've got a small, a few millimetres of benzoic acid crystals at the bottom of that capillary tube and we're now in a position to check the melting points using the melting point apparatus. So we put our mercury thermometer, which goes up to 350 degrees, in the big hole in the heating block. And we then put our sample in the middle hole. And we then switch on the, the heater. So, by looking at the literature, we know the melting point of 
pure benzoic acid should be 122 degrees. So what we are going to do is record when the sample starts to melt and when it's fully melted. If the sample is pure, then that range will be very small, one or two degrees, and it'll be very close to the literature value of 122 degrees. The more impure it is, then the larger the range is, and the melting point tends to be depressed, so it would be significantly less than 122 degrees. So we get it melting at 115, then it's not very pure. If it's about 120, then that's not too bad. Now, we can heat it up quite fast at first until we get to about, say, 100 degrees. Then we want the temperature to go up very slowly, no more than one degree a minute. Now, the glass in the mercury thermometer is a lot thicker than the glass in the capillary tube. So the temperature on the thermometer tends to go up more slowly than the temperature in the capillary tube. So if you're heating it very fast, then the temperature that you record is probably lower than the actual value being experienced by the benzoic acid crystals. But if, you're, if the temperature is going up very slowly near the end point, then the difference is minimal. Okay, so the sample is just coming up to about 110 degrees. So we will have a look at it and uh, hopefully it should start melting in the next 10 degrees or so. So we're now about 111, no sign of it's melting, that's good. And 13, remember it's 122 we're trying to get to, and then 14, so 116, so it should start to go pretty soon, so it's just starting to melt now, that's 118. And it's totally melted. Now, it's 118 to 120. So our melting point range was 118 to 120 degrees C. The actual melting point should have been 122 degrees C and I'm reasonably happy with that result. It suggests that there's some small impurities in the sample but it's not, it's pretty pure. The results from our melting point analysis suggest that we've got a pretty pure sample of benzoic acid but they recommend to double check this you do a mixed melting point analysis. That involves uh, mixing together equal quantities of your benzoic acid that you've prepared and some pure benzoic acid. Okay, now the 50-50 mixture doesn't need to be identical, so roughly one spatula of each. We'll then grind them up for a minute to make sure your mortar and pestle are clean before doing this. So we've got an homogeneous mix of the two samples. 
Thereafter, we just carry out another melting point analysis, only in this case it's called a mixed melting point analysis, using a new capillary tube, uh, transfer some of the mixed sample uh, into the capillary tube, do a melting point analysis, and if the two compounds are identical, the pure benzoic acid and what you've made, then once again, the melting point range should be small and very close to our literature value of 122 degrees C. The results for my mixed melting point analysis were identical to my melting point analysis. I got a melting point range from 118 to 120 degrees C, with the actual melting point of course being 122 degrees C. The fact that I got an identical result for the melting point and the mixed melting point analysis suggests to me that I've got a very pure sample. The fact that it's a couple of degrees less than the actual melting point is probably due to the fact that I was heating the sample a little bit too quickly and so the reading on the thick walled thermometer was in fact a couple of degrees less than the temperature being experienced by the benzoic acid sample. So I think that slight depression in the melting point was probably due to my uh, bad anatole technique. I should have been raising the temperature more slowly. Okay, so both the melting point analysis and the mixed melting point analysis are fairly positive, suggesting that we've got a pretty pure sample of benzoic acid. So our third and final check on the purity is going to be thin layer chromatography. I've dissolved about half a spatula of my my sample of benzoic acid in about a one centimetre depth of ethyl ethanoate. And I've labelled the sample an S for sample. And in this test tube I've put about half a spatula of the pure benzoic acid and uh, dissolved that in a small amount of the ethyl ethanoate. So I'm now ready to carry out thin layer chromatography. So I've prepared my uh, TLC plate here. I've made a light pencil mark about one centimetre from the bottom using a pencil. I've then put two small marks, one labelled P where I'll put a few drops of my product, the pure sample, I mean, and then under the S I'll put a few drops of the sample of benzoic acid that I prepared. So, if we get a capillary tube and just dip it into our ethyl thanoate, which has our sample dissolved in it, and put a small spot on the TLC plate and then using a separate capillary tube do the same thing for the pure sample. Get a small amount in the capillary tube and put a spot on the P. Right. We then leave this for maybe about a minute for both the spots to dry and then repeat that another three times. So here's one, here's one I've already prepared. So now we're going to put it into our chromatography chamber, which contains a small amount of dichloromethane in it. Uh, we don't want the dichloromethane to reach the pencil line. So just put it in gently, cover it with a watch glass so we don't uh, lose too much of the dichloromethane through evaporation. and. We shall leave it in the chromatography chamber until the solvent front is just a few millimetres from the top of the TLC plate, at which point we'll take it out, immediately mark with a pencil where the solvent front is, and then we'll leave it to dry. I've left the sample for about 10 minutes now, and I don't know if you can quite see this, but the solvent front is getting quite near the top of the TLC plate, so I'm going to take it out of the 
chromatogram chamber now a mark with a pencil line where the solvent front is. And thereafter, we're going to leave the TLC plate for about 10 minutes to dry. Right, the sample is now dry, but as you can see, perhaps, as there's nothing to be seen on the TLC plate. That's because the benzoic acid is not going to be visible. So we have to make the benzoic acid visible by developing the TLC plate. And this is probably the hardest part of the experiment. And it's not one that's always been successful, but we'll give it a go. So in your handbook, there's actually two ways suggested for developing the chromatogram. The first way involves developing it with iodine. So we'll try that one first. So we get a 250ml beaker and add a few drops of, a few drops, a few crystals of iodine to it. We then place our chromatogram in it. Okay, and just put a watch glass over it. Now, the idea is that the iodine uh, is quite a volatile substance and uh, will quite easily turn to a gas. And the iodine will interact with the benzoic acid and produce a brown patch on the TLC plate where the benzoic acid is. So we'll put that aside and leave it to develop and see if anything comes of it. Now, assuming that anything visible does come out from uh, our development, what we hope we don't see is that in our sample we get more than one dot. That would suggest we've got three different compounds in our sample. We want to just get one dot, which shows that our sample is pure. So, if we just get one dot, okay, what we can do is measure the RF value. And the RF value is defined as the ratio of the distance the dot has travelled, the benzoic acid, to the distance the solvent front has travelled. So the RF value is A over B, and we can determine that value. And technically, we could then look up a textbook and compare our RF value with that as you'd expect to get from benzoic acid. The reference would have to be done under the exact same conditions, same solvent, same temperature, etc. So actually what it's easier to do, and what we've done of course, is run our pure sample at the same time. And hopefully the RF value for our sample will be identical to the RF value for the pure sample and that would prove that our sample is very pure. So we'll wait and see if anything comes from the developing of our chromatograms. Here's a chromatogram after it's been left for about 20 minutes with the iodine crystals and it has actually developed it reasonably well and hopefully you can see that sort of purple mark might not show up very well in the video uh, which shows the distance travelled by the benzoic acid. I've just put a little pencil mark at the top of each one, uh, here and here, showing the distance travelled by both the pure sample and the sample that we uh, made. And I haven't done exact measurements, but just visually you can see that both the pure sample and our sample have travelled essentially the exact same distance. So here I've sketched what the thin layer chromatogram looked like and uh, the RF value, taking the A and B value from the real chromatogram, not the drawing. So for the product we made, A over B, so the distance that the sample travelled was 4.7 centimetres divided by distance the solvent travelled was 5.8 centimetres. So that gave a RF value of 0 0.81.
and RF value for the pure benzoic acid was also 0.81. So, it says, comment on the purity of your product based on all the information from the chromatogram. Well, there's two pieces of information that suggests the purity of our product is very good. Firstly, there's only one spot, and secondly, the RF value of the sample is the same as the RF value of the pure product. I should mention that uh, when I used the UV lamp to look at the chromatograms, it didn't really uh, help much, so I suggest you just stick to using the iodine for developing the chromatogram. Okay, finally, and very importantly in terms of the exams, you should now complete a discussion in which you give reasons why your percentage yield was less than 100%, and then you discuss the recrystallization process, which is what we used to purify the sample, and seemingly in this case was very successful. So you have to explain why water was a good choice for the solvent for recrystallization of benzoic acid, and secondly, you have to explain how recrystallization purifies a sample. Now, if you have any problems with answering these questions about the recrystallization, I suggest that you look up your support notes for Unit 3, because this is the sort of thing that you're going to have to answer in the exam, so make sure you can write a good answer for these things. Okay, so that's a bit of a marathon of an experiment, but it's very, very important as uh, it's the first time we've looked at all these methods for checking the purity of samples, the melting point analysis, mixed melting point analysis, and thin layer chromatography.